uh, Justin, and he will be uh, giving us an introduction uh, to exotic breeds. Uh, please, Justin, go ahead. All right, great, thanks. So um, everybody can see the slide, right? As well as this this red yep. point. Yep. All right, fantastic. So thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. Um, so I was asked to give a gentle introduction to exotic brains. So that's going to be the goal of today's talk. And I think instead of giving some extended introduction as to why you should be interested in exotic brains, it's more useful to just jump right into it and tell you how you could encounter an exotic brain out in the wild. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna just take standard um, D brain or NS5 brain setups that we're familiar with, and we're just going to repeatedly apply S and T duality transformations until something new pops up. Okay, so let's see this by means of an explicit example here. Let's go ahead and consider an NS5 brain in type 2B. So this object, we all know, has a tension which goes like 1 over G string squared, L string to the sixth. And now what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm going to compactify this on a transverse circle and then T-dualize. Okay, so I compactify and I'll call the radius of the compact direction R1. And now I T-dualize. And when I do so, uh, we know that I invert the radius of the circle and I also shift the string coupling as shown here. Okay. So upon T-dualizing, what I end up with is an object in type 2A whose tension goes as shown here. Okay, so here I've just naively applied these transformations to this formula for the tension here. So I can ask the audience now, what is this object? What's the object that has this tension? And since the audience is muted, I'll just answer on their behalf. So this is a KK monopole. So this is something which is sort of exotic, but it's still within the realm of things that most string theorists would be familiar with. Okay, but the thing which is slightly exotic about it is the fact that the KK monopole cannot be interpreted as just taking some standard higher dimensional brain and wrapping it on a circle. Okay, you can see this by this R squared behavior in the tension, right? So if I were to just simply take a brain and wrap it on a circle, I would get R behavior, not R squared. So this KK monopole is sort of intrinsically its own object. All right, so um, now we're going to go ahead and repeat this procedure. We're just going to go ahead and compactify again on a transverse circle and again T-dualize. And when I do so, I'm going to get an object now back in type 2B, which has a tension which goes as shown here. So we see that we now have two sort of special directions along which I have this R squared behavior. Okay, and so for the same reasons as before, this object cannot be interpreted as just some higher dimensional brain wrapped on the circles. Okay, so what is the object which is obtained in this way? Well, it's something which is known as a 522 exotic brain in some notation, which I'll describe momentarily, and it's something which is probably less familiar for us. Okay, but this 522 um, is really just the tip of the iceberg here. We could uh, continue by applying S and T transformations and we'll get even more and more unfamiliar things. For example, we're now back in type 2B. So I can now go ahead and do S duality to get a different setup in type 2B. So if I do an S transformation, I know that I invert the string coupling and I also shift the string length as shown here. And so if I just go ahead and as usual, apply this to the formula for the tension above, I now get an object which has a tension that goes as shown here. I again have two special directions with R squared behavior. And the only thing that's really different between this and this is the fact that I now have G string cubed in the denominator. Okay. And so uh, the object that has this tension is what's known as a 532 exotic brain. Okay, and um, this thing certainly, again, cannot be interpreted as just wrapping a standard brain in higher dimensions. That follows from the fact that I have this R squared here, but it also follows from the fact that I have G string cubed in the denominator now. 
none of the standard D brains or NS5 brain has G string cubed behavior for its tension. All right, so uh, we've now seen how one can encounter exotic brains really easily. You just start with your favorite setup, say an NS5 brain, and you just apply a very simple chain of S or T dualities. Now, um, let me go ahead and introduce this notation that I've been using. So this is the standard notation. So an exotic brain is referred to as a B subscript alpha superscript beta exotic brain if it has a tension which goes as shown here. Okay, so what are the salient features of this? So the subscript alpha tells you the number of factors of G string in the denominator. The superscript beta tells you how many of these special directions with R squared behavior you have. And B is just the usual number of world volume dimensions minus one. Okay, so for example, if I wanted to write the NS5 in this notation, because it's tension, is shown uh, is as shown here. I know I have a subscript two for the two factors of g string squared and zero special directions. Okay, and for the KK5 monopole, likewise, I have uh, one special direction, so one superscript, and again, two factors of g string squared. And just to really drive the point home here, the 522 exotic brain has two factors of g string squared in the denominator and two special directions. And the 532 exotic brain has three factors of G string squared, or sorry, G string in the denominator and two um, R squared directions. All right, so that's the notation. Now, this notation, so the exotic brains that we've encountered thus far are actually a very limited set of exotic brains. More generally, one could have exotic brains which have not just R squared behavior, but R cubed behavior and our fourth behavior, so on and so forth. So the notation for those is simply to use multiple superscripts, okay, and it's in descending order. So the beta captures the number of R squared directions, gamma the number of R cubed directions, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is the notation. So to summarize thus far, we've seen that despite their name, exotic brains are really not all that exotic, in fact, they're really ubiquitous um, by just applying even the simplest U-duality transformations, I easily map from standard brain configurations to them. So they're really needed for closure of U-duality. And as we all know, the more we compactify, the larger the U-duality group becomes. Right? In particular, M theory on a K-torus has a U-duality group, which is this split discrete form of EK. So this obviously grows with K. And so the more I compactify, the larger the U-duality group is. The larger the U-duality group is, the more exotic brains are needed to fill out orbits of the U-duality group. So for example, if I go ahead and I compactify type 2B on a seven torus, say, that is down to three dimensions, then what one gets is this list of uh, exotic brains. So the standard brains are sort of uh, these ones right here. These are the ones that we're used to talking about, but we see that there's a whole panoply of uh, exotic brains that we probably have never encountered before, but they're really necessary if we want to uh, fill out our U-duality orbits properly. Okay, and things really get out of hand if we compactify all the way down to two dimensions. Okay, so this was three dimensions. So if I compactify down to two dimensions, that would be like M theory on T9. And if I were to just naively extrapolate this formula for the U-duality group, I would conclude that in 2D, the U-duality group is some split form of E9, but E9 is a Katz-Moody algebra, and hence I would assume that there would need to be an infinite number of exotic brains to fill out the orbits. Okay, so we see that exotic brains are much, much more um, prevalent than normal brains, so they're certainly worth studying. And part of our goal today is going to be to understand the sort of classification of all of these objects. But before telling you about the classification, I would uh, instead like to begin by telling you how exotic brains fit into the topic of today's lectures. Uh, that is to say, how do they fit into this whole program of non-geometric backgrounds, et cetera? 
So in order to address that connection, let's ask the following question. So I've told you that exotic brains cannot be interpreted as simply wrapping higher dimensional brains on circles, but they should have some higher dimensional origin. And so it's natural to ask where exactly do they come from in 10 or 11 D? And this question was answered by uh, these people here. So they argued that exotic brains actually descend from non-geometric backgrounds of exactly the type that we've been talking about today. Okay, so what's the basic idea of this, of this connection? So we're gonna give much more detail on this in the following slides, but uh, for now, let me just sketch the idea. So first, it turns out that exotic brains always appear in co-dimension two or lower. Okay, so let's focus on co-dimension two here. As a good example to have in mind, we can go back to the 522 exotic brain here. This is going to be our favorite example today. So the 522 was co-dimension two because we had to, to see it, we had to compactify two dimensions. So down to 8D. And in 8D, a five brain, which has six world volume dimensions is co-dimension two. Okay. So, uh, exotic brains appear in co-dimension two, and hence, just like a seven brain in 10D, they'll, in, they'll induce some monodromy on the scalar fields in the lower dimensional theory. Okay, now if I wanna lift this to some higher dimensional theory, then we know that the scalar fields are embedded in tensor fields. So things like your p-form fields or your metric, et cetera. And hence we would conclude that in the presence of an exotic brain, the higher dimensional solution actually has some monodromy in the metric or in the, uh, the p-form fields. And so clearly this goes outside of the usual paradigm of geometry into this realm of non-geometry, okay? So in order to really properly understand exotic brains, one needs a manifestly T or U duality invariant formulation of string and M theory. And this is where things like double field theory and exceptional field theory come in. All right, so that's the connection to the ideas that we've been discussing today. So let's give some more detail on this, this, uh, this connection. Okay, so as usual, we're going to be focusing on our friend, the 522 exotic brain. And I've told you that the 522 exotic brain can be obtained by just t-dualizing twice, starting from the NS5 brain. So, Let's go ahead and see what that looks like at the level of supergravity. Okay, so I'm going to begin with the supergravity solution describing the NS5 brain. Okay, so that's just as shown here. So we have the world volume dimensions of the NS5 brain, which are here. So I think the notation is probably self-evident, self but just to clarify, this is shorthand for this. Okay, and likewise for this piece here. So in any case, I have these, these longitudinal directions and then I have these four transverse directions here. And the transverse directions are weighted by a metric factor F, which takes the usual sort of harmonic function form here. So I have one plus Q, which is the charge of the NS5 brain over R squared. And R is the radius in the transverse directions. Okay, and the NS5 brain also sources a B field and a dilaton as well. Okay, so, um, and maybe just to draw a picture here. So when R is going to infinity, so we're far away from the NS5 brain, F is basically just one. So we're in flat space effectively. And when I go towards R is equal to zero, I get some divergence in the metric, which gives rise to some throat-like thing. Okay, so this is as R goes to zero and we approach the NSR. All right, so this is the familiar metric of the NS5 brain and now we're going to go ahead and apply some T-duality to it. But, um, so I'm actually going to be fairly thorough or pedagogical with this T-duality. So this is probably more detail than some of you would like, but I think that there are a lot of subtleties here that are not commonly appreciated that I'd like to bring your attention to. So let's try and do this T-duality fairly explicitly. So 
we're going to begin by compactifying one of the transverse directions. Okay, let's say the x9 direction. So to compactify it, I have to make the metric, of course, periodic under it. Uh, that is to say, I want it to be periodic under shifts of x9 by 2 pi uh, r9, where r9 is the radius of the circle. So in order to make it uh, periodic, what I can do is I can take the metric function f and simply sum it over images in x9. Okay, so here I've split capital R into little r. So little r is now the radius in the three non-compact transverse directions. And then into this x9 piece, and I've summed over images here. So now that I have a circle, I would like to go ahead and t-dualize it by applying my usual Boucher rules. Okay, so the Boucher rules are some rules for doing a t-duality. For example, we know that I shift, uh, sorry, I invert the radius of the x9 circle. Uh, so that's this. And then, for example, uh, if I have some off-diagonal component of my B field, I'll generate an off-diagonal component of my metric as well, so on and so forth. So these are some standard rules that we would like to apply, but we actually cannot apply them as it currently stands. And the reason that we can't apply them as it currently stands is that in order to apply the Boucher rules, we actually need an isometry direction. Okay, so it's true that we have a circle direction here, but we don't have an isometry along the circle because the NS5 brain is localized at a specific point on the circle. Okay, a certain point in the X9 direction. So as it currently stands, we actually can't just t-dualize by applying these Boucher rules. So what people usually do in this situation is then the following. So what people usually do in this situation is they say, okay, when R9 is very small, I can go ahead and I can approximate this discrete parameter n here by a continuous parameter. And then I can convert the sum to an integral as shown here. And if I evaluate the integral, I get something which is independent of x9. Okay, so this is called the smeared solution. So it's called smeared because we've effectively, well, smeared the NS5 brain along the circle. But a crucial point is that the smeared solution is not actually a solution of the stringy equations of motion. So the smeared solution is not actually a solution. And for that reason, everything that's going to follow from this point onwards is not going to be completely legitimate. So we're going to readdress this and try to make it legitimate towards the end. But for now, let's just run with it. Okay, let's do the smearing and then apply the Boucher rules like one is used to. Okay, so we smear, we apply the Boucher rules, and what we get out is this. So this is the metric for the KK model. Okay, so I have the longitudinal directions here. I have the three non-compact transverse directions, and I have the uh, T dualized X9 direction. So I see I've inverted the radius and I've generated some off diagonal component here. So that comes from this transformation rule. Okay, and it's actually this sort of KK gauge field that gives rise to the name KK monopole. All right, so in any case, I have the KK monopole. Now, our end goal is to get to the 522 exotic brain, remember? So to get to the 522, remember, I'm supposed to t-dualize again, okay, again on a transverse direction. So let's choose the x8 direction. And let's again do the same sort of uh, steps that we did previously. So that is to say, we begin by compactifying x8 by summing over images. Okay, so here I've split little r into rho, which is now the radius in the remaining two non-compact transverse directions, and then into x8. Uh, and I've summed over images in x8. And now in order to apply Boucher rules, I have to do this same smearing procedure that I did before. So I assume r8 is small. I change this sum to an integral and I try to evaluate the integral. But there's a crucial difference between the current smearing and the previous smearing. So notice that we have this, this uh, square root here in the denominator. We didn't used to have this square root here. 
Remember, we used to have r squared, but after I smeared once, I ended up getting just r in the denominator. Okay, and what the square root does is it means that when I try to evaluate this second smearing integral, this is actually not convergent anymore. Okay, so I'm going to have to cut off this integral, so I'll call the cutoff lambda, and the result after smearing is then this function. Okay, but this metric, this, this smeared function here, should not be interpreted as holding out, holding up to um, arbitrarily large rho. Okay, so this metric does not describe a standalone, completely consistent object. Okay. So we're going to readdress this divergence in a moment, but okay, let's just boldly proceed forward and see what we get. So we just smear, we forget about the divergence for the time being, we apply the Boucher rules, and what I get out is a metric which tentatively describes the 522 uh, exotic brain. And we see that it looks like this. I have the longitudinal directions, I have the two non-compact transverse directions. And finally, I have this, this torus here. And the crucial thing for our purposes is this metric factor here. Okay, so the metric factor is F over F squared plus theta Q tilde. So what is Q tilde? Q tilde is just this combination of Q and the various radii. So in other words, it's this combination here. And what is theta? Well, uh, what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've taken this, uh, these transverse directions here. So this is basically just a plane and I've written it in polar coordinates. Okay, that's it. All right, so theta is just supposed to be the angular coordinate which goes around the five, two, two brain. All right, but what we see then is the following. Clearly, this metric is not single valued under going from theta is equal to zero to theta is equal to two pi, right? Because at theta is equal to zero, this metric factor is just one over f, but at theta is equal to two pi, it's clearly not one over f. So we see that the metric has some monodromy, uh, which makes it clearly not a well-defined geometry, but exactly the sort of thing that, for example, David was talking, in the talking about in the previous talks. Okay, we see that we likewise get some monodromy for the B field, et cetera. Okay, so this is what we mean when we say that the 522 is lifted to uh, some non-geometric background. And if we wanna be more concrete, we could ask what type of non-geometric background is this? And it turns out that this is exactly a t-fold. Okay, so to see that this is just a standard t-fold, we can do the usual thing where we uh, organize g and b into this generalized metric. Okay, so here I'm thinking of this generalized metric h as a four by four matrix. So g and b individually are thought of as two by two matrices in the x uh, eight nine plane. Okay, well, maybe just to be explicit here, what I mean is, so I interpret G as two by two matrix, G88, G89, G98, G99. Okay, and likewise for B. And so I put them together. Uh, I have some four by four matrix H. And now I could see how H transforms as I go from theta is equal to zero to pi. So just using these explicit formulas here, I easily find that H transforms uh, up to a conjugated version of itself, where the, conjugate, where the conjugation matrix omega here takes this form. And one can check that this matrix omega here satisfies this relationship here, which is exactly the sort of thing, uh, which is exactly the equation which tells you that omega is an element of SO2 comma two as you would expect for a t-fold, okay? So um, in the language that, that David was using, this would be an example of a, a globally 
non-geometric background. All right, great. So, um, right, so what have we seen? To summarize, what we've seen is that the 522 exotic brain, when lifted to the full 10-dimensional theory, uh, is actually a non-geometric background. But just to sort of repeat, in the lower dimensional theory, it's not a non-geometric background. It's just a normal brain, right? Because if I were to just reduce on these circle dimensions, then the metric is just this. And this is just a normal metric for a brain. There's no non-geometry going on at all. Okay, the point is that this sort of brain solution here doesn't lift to, um, doesn't lift to uh, a higher dimensional brain solution. Instead, it lifts to this non-geometric solution. Though. I just described. All right, great. So that's the basic idea. Now there were various subtle points that we swept under the rug to get to this to this point. So let's go ahead and address those now. So the first thing uh, that should be addressed is that divergence in row that I mentioned previously. Okay, so remember the metric actually diverged at some row. So what that means is that the five two two should not be taken as a standalone object, okay? It itself it is not actually well-defined, but this is not really particularly surprising. It shouldn't worry us too much. The same is actually true of say PQ7 brains, right? I think we're all familiar with the fact that PQ7 brains cannot be defined in isolation for the exact same reason that you have some log row behavior and so you get some divergence. So there are various ways of resolving this though. You know, nobody would just say that uh, PQ7 brains are useless, right? Uh, you just have to uh, resolve the divergence in some way. So for example, one thing you could do is you could take 24 PQ7 brains. And if you take 24 of them together, then it turns out that the back reaction is so large that you change the transverse plane into a sphere actually. Uh, and so a sphere is now compact, so you don't have to worry about this sort of divergence. Okay, and there's other ways to uh, resolve the issue as well. Um, and I won't describe all of them, but I just want to say that this divergence shouldn't actually be uh, too, too bothersome. I think the somewhat more interesting uh, subtlety is that of the smearing that we mentioned, okay? So remember, we had to do the smearing in order to apply the Boucher rules, but the smear geometries are not really solutions. So there was some level of illegitimacy to everything, you know, including the KK monopole and the 522, everything that uh, came about after that initial smearing. So to see how to um, fix this, we can go ahead and go back to the NS5 brain so remember that the metric factor for the NS5 uh, looked as shown here. Okay, so this is after compactifying the X9 direction. And what we had done previously is we had assumed that R9 was very small, we converted this to an integral, and then we just evaluated. That was the smearing. But instead of doing that, we can actually just evaluate this infinite sum explicitly. And if we do so, what we get is some simple ratio of cinch and cosh and cosine. Okay. Now, if we go ahead and convert these trigonometric functions to exponential functions, what we get out is this. So you will recognize these first, this, this piece here, this is exactly the smeared solution. And so what we see is that the exact localized solution is equal to the smeared solution up to exponential corrections. Now, whenever one sees exponential corrections like this, one should think that something non-perturbative is coming into play. And indeed, it was explained, for example, in this paper by David Tong, that the uh, smeared solution is actually corrected to the localized solution via some world sheet instantons. So um, one thing that we could do to fix the various illegi illegitimacies of our previous uh, T dualities is to do the following. We smear 
Then we do the Boucher rules just like before. But then after doing the Boucher rules, we make sure to take into account all of the world sheet instanton effects. And that will correct the solution to the actual real solution. Okay, so for example, uh, one can do the Boucher rules to go to the KK monopole and then take into account world sheet effects. And one again sees that one gets localization. The only difference is that whereas the NS5 brain is localized to a specific point on the actual geometric circle, it turns out that the KK5 monopole ends up being localized in the winding core. So this is sort of hard to visualize, but in any case, um, one can fairly straightforwardly uh, compute these corrections and get the actual legitimate uh, KK5 monopole solution, not the smeared one we had before. And one can then do the same thing for the 522. And what one finds, once again, is that the metric factor is equal to the smeared version that we had, and then plus some instanton corrections of this formula. Okay, so that's um, pretty much all I wanted to say about exotic brains and non-geometry. So that's sort of part one of the talk. I now want to switch gears a bit and tell you about something which is more, let's say, combinatoric. I wanna tell you about the classification of exotic brains. Okay, so before moving on, I can ask, are there any pressing questions about this? Okay, so if not, then I'm gonna go ahead and proceed to tell you a little bit about the classification of exotic brains. All right, so remember that the way that we encountered our first exotic brain was we just started with a standard brain and we applied two T dualities, right? That's how we got the five, two, two. So, our first guess for how we would classify exotic brains is to just repeat this at a much larger scale. We just start with every possible standard brain and apply S and T transformations in all possible combinations. And if one were to go ahead and do that, what one would get is a picture that looks uh, as shown here. So here I've taken this very nice diagram from this paper here. Okay, so one would get a picture like this. So let's try and explore this diagram a little bit. So let's start here in type 2b at the NS5 brain. Okay, so the red arrows here are T dualities, and we see that there's a T duality which takes me from the NS5 brain to the KK5 monopole. Now the KK5 monopole is also down here, so let's let's move our eyes down here. So I can then T dualize the KK5 monopole and get the 522 exotic brain. Okay, that's the chain of T dualities that we just studied at great lengths. Okay. And um, on the first slide, we also mentioned that one can furthermore do an S duality, which is this black line here, to go from the 522 to the 532. And that's basically as far as we've gotten thus far. But of course, one could just continue this pattern. Um, so for example, once I'm at the 532, I can go ahead and I can t-dualize both transversely or longitudinally. And if I do so, I'm going to end up with something called a 433 and the 631. And then I can t-dualize the 433 to get the 34, sorry, 334. And then I can s-dualize and this thing is self-dual under s-duality, et cetera, et cetera. So one just repeats this procedure and one obtains a diagram like this. Uh, oh, and one thing which is definitely worth mentioning is that this diagram here does not contain things which are co-dimension zero or uh, one. So this is only things which are co-dimension two or higher, which is why you don't see here, say a D8 or a D9 brain. If one were to account for the D8 and D9s, actually this web becomes much more complicated. All right, so this is the sort of web that one would get out. Now, I've told you that exotic brains are needed to fill out U-duality orbits. And I've also told you that for M-theory on TK, 
the U duality group is some split form of EK. So let's see how this filling out of U duality orbits actually happens in a very explicit example. So let's go ahead and consider the theory on an eight torus. That is to say, we go down to three dimensions. And we're going to focus on co-dimension two objects in three dimensions. That is to say, just particles. Okay, so the particles in 3D should organize themselves into multiplets, uh, uh, into a multiplet, which is a, a representation of E8. Right? So let's see how this representation of E8 comes about. All right, so we're gonna go back to this slide here and I'm going to erase what I've drawn here. All right, great. Okay, so we're going to do the analysis uh, in type 2a. Okay, you can do it in type 2b or in M theory as well, but let's just do it in type 2a for now. So the question is, how do I get uh, particle states in 3D in type 2a? Okay, so in uh, 3D, in other words, is type 2a on the seven torus, right? So one way that I can get a particle state is I can just take the D0 brain, which is a particle in 10D already, and just do nothing with it. I don't compactify it or anything like that. I just don't touch it. And uh, the D0 clearly gives me a particle in 3D. Okay, so the D0 brain gives me one particle state. Okay, now what about the D2 brain? So for the D2 brain, to get a particle in 3D, I clearly have to wrap uh, two of the directions, two of the world volume directions of the D2 on some of the directions of the seven torus. And the total number of ways of doing so is just seven choose two. Okay, in other words, this is 21. Okay, likewise, the number of particle states I get out of the D4 is seven choose four, which I believe is 35. And then the D6, seven choose six, which is seven. And finally for the NS5 here, I have seven choose five, which is 21. Okay, great. So these are the particle states that I get out from just wrapping standard D and NS brains. And we see that this is not enough to form a representation of E8, right? Because, well, the total number of states I have so far is like one plus 21 plus 35 plus seven plus 21. But the smallest representation of E8 is the, the adjoint or the fundamental, which is 248 dimensional. This clearly doesn't add up to 248 yet. So, we're missing something. And what we're missing are these exotic brain states. Okay, so let's try to account for all of those, starting with the, the only semi-exotic one, which was the KK5 monopole. So how many states does the KK5 monopole contribute? Well, remember the KK5 monopole had one direction, which was special, uh, special in the sense that I had that R squared behavior Okay, so first I can choose that one special direction. The number of ways of doing so is seven, choose one, seven, in other words. And then I can choose among the six remaining torus directions. Uh, I can choose five of them to compactify the remaining directions of the KK5 to get a particle. Okay, so the total number of states that I obtain in this way is, let's see, seven times six, so 42. Okay, and we can do the same analysis for the 522. Okay, so the 522 brain in type 2a. So this is now the number of particle states. This gives me a seven choose two, five choose five, which is 21. And so in any case, you get the point. We repeat this sort of counting for the 522, two, the six, uh, three, one, and so on and so forth, all of these guys here. And once we do the counting, at the end of the day, we get a table like this. Okay, so we just did these ones live a moment ago. 
and you just repeat that same sort of counting for the other guys. And uh, so we get these numbers here, we add them up, and we cross our fingers and hope that it gives us 248 at least. But unfortunately, what one finds if one actually adds these all up is that you only get 240 states. Okay, so actually, the states that we get from these exotic brains are not enough to fill out these U duality orbits like we would expect. Okay, so what went wrong? Where are the missing states? Okay, well, the origin of the missing states is that thus far, we've only been considering T and S transformations. Okay, so if I go back to this web here, uh, this, this thing is composed entirely of just T and S transformations. That's all there was to it. But it turns out that T and S do not actually themselves generate the full U-duality U group. Instead, what they generate is the so-called vile subgroup of the U-duality group. This is, this is actually a bit of a misnomer because the vile group of a group is not, at least in a naive sense, a subgroup of the group. But there is some sense in which this, is, this can be made correct. So um, in any case, T and S generate some subgroup of the full U duality group. And physically, this is the subgroup which preserves the rectangular torus or vanishing background gauge field conditions. That is to say, if I start with just a rectangular torus, by applying only T and S, I'm never going to get a tilted or twisted torus. Likewise, if I start with a setup where all of my gauge fields are turned off, by applying S and T, I'm not going to get something with the gauge fields turned on. So it's a physically restricted set of U-duality transformations. Now, mathematically, the statement is that these are the transformations which preserve the lengths of roots. Okay, so every state in the multiplet corresponds to a root. And so when I'm using S and T to go between states, I can think of that as mapping between roots. And uh, S and T always preserve the length of the roots. Now, since E8 uh, in particular, but E, E, D more generally, uh, is simply laced, all of the roots have the same length except for those in the carton. Okay, so what that means is that using S and T, uh, if I apply S and T to a generic brain, I can only reach the dimension of ED minus the dimension of the carton, different brains, right? And the dimension of the carton is just the rank, so it's just D. And so what that means is that applying S and T to a generic brain in the case of E8 only produces 248 minus eight, that is to say 240 uh, different states. And that's exactly what we found before. I just seen you have eight minutes left. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. So um, to get the remaining eight states, uh, we have to act by uh, elements which are in the, uh, the complements of this vial subgroup, that is to say the Borel subgroup. And physically, these would be like transformations that shift the p-form gauge fields or the so-called mixed symmetry potentials. So the mixed symmetry potentials are like, uh, these are the sort of things that would make the torus into a, a twisted or tilted torus. All right. Um, and so an interesting fact is that the remaining states are always non-supersymmetric. Okay, this I think was first said clearly in some paper by Axel Kleinschmidt here. And so in the current case, it turns out that there are eight non-supersymmetric seven two brains each of which contributes one co-dimension two state on a seven torus, and that's where the remaining eight states come from. All right, so that actually concludes the bulk of the talk. I just wanna tell you now briefly some stuff going beyond uh, what we've learned thus far. So, um, well, first of all, we should note that we did this analysis of the of the multiplets only for the particle multiplet in 3D. We could also consider the co-dimension zero or co-dimension one multiplets in 3D. 
And we could also do the analysis for any d greater than or equal to three too. Okay, and so in fact, um, an impressive, uh, impressive analysis of this was given in, in this paper, which built on sort of previous works by various authors. And one key ingredient in this analysis is the use of mixed symmetry potentials. Okay, so what's a mixed symmetry potential just really quickly. So we're all familiar with p-form gauge fields. So these are like things with p anti-symmetrized indices. A mixed symmetry potential is something with different groupings of anti-symmetric indices. So for example, this eight, uh, eight comma two mixed symmetry potential would be something that has eight anti-symmetrized indices and then another two anti-symmetrized indices like this. Okay. So it turns out that just like D brains are charged under P4 and gauge fields, so too are non-geometric backgrounds charged under mixed symmetry potentials. Actually, because I think I have uh, a little bit of time, let me just say, so uh, in David's talk, he told us nicely that there was some sort of tower of, of fluxes, this tower here, B, C, Q, A, B, C, R, A, B, C. Right, so this is the flux of an NS5. Oops, I just erased it. This is the flux of an NS5. This was for the KK monopole. This is for the 522. And this ends up being something for the 523. In any case, the way that these things are related to these mixed symmetry potentials is the following. So one begins by Hodge dualizing the lower indices, okay, to get a flux, which, so Hodge duality in 10D would change this from two indices to eight indices. So I'd have eight lower and one upper index. And here I would have nine lower and two upper index. And here I would have 10 lower and uh, three upper indices. And these fluxes are uh, exactly the fluxes for the mixed symmetry potentials shown above. All right, so anyways, uh, one way to classify exotic brains is to classify the stuff that they're charged under, that is to say these mixed symmetry potentials. And in turn, one could ask, how does one classify mixed symmetry potentials? And it turns out to be a very nice way of doing so by means of some uh, conjecture by Peter West, which is the E11 conjecture. So roughly speaking, this says that 11 dimensional supergravity is a nonlinear sigma model with E11 target space in some sense. So that is a very interesting idea that unfortunately I don't have any time to talk about today. I would highly recommend anybody who's interested to read the relevant literature. There's really nice articles by Peter West himself. And so E11 has really proven to be a fruitful framework for understanding exotic brains, as well as deformations of supergravity. And I think it's something that remains highly understudied. Okay, um, and let me just close with one final comment about something that I've personally worked on. So it turns out that there are some interesting relations between exotic brains and certain complex surfaces known as del Pezzo surfaces. These are basically just, uh, just uh, copies of P2, CP2 with uh, various points blown up. So it turns out that exotic brains of type BG, where importantly I have this superscript G, this is the number of R squared directions. It turns out that such exotic brains are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the genus G curves, complex curves in the del Pezzo surfaces. So I think this is something that really remains mysterious and it would be great if somebody were to think about this connection more and, and explain it. All right, so that's it for now. Thank you very much.